Hello everyone, this is Anuradha Sharma and you are watching my channel Eyes with Anuradha. Section 1 You will hear a woman phoning to inquire about house rental. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello. Thank you for calling Iris Rentals. How can I help you? Yes, hello there. I'm ringing just to make inquiries about renting a new property. And I came across a listing on your website that I'm interested in. Oh, yes. I'd like to find out a few more details, if I may. Yes, of course. Can I take your name? It's Mary Collins. The name of the woman is Mary Collins. So, Mary Collins has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello. Thank you for calling Iris Rentals. How can I help you? Yes, hello there. I'm ringing just to make inquiries about renting a new property. And I came across a listing on your website that I'm interested in. Oh, yes. I'd like to find out a few more details, if I may. Yes, of course. Can I take your name? It's Mary Collins. OK, Mary. I'm just searching our system for the property details. Is there any information in particular that you were wanting? Does the house have a gym? No, the house doesn't have a gym. However, the house has a large swimming pool, which will be great for exercise and really refreshing during the summer. Oh, wow. That sounds lovely. What is the general layout of the house? This house is rather unusual, as the living room is located upstairs with the bedrooms, and downstairs at the ground floor is the dining room, which has a lovely view out over the swimming pool. Does the house come with a car parking space on the street? Oh, there's no need for that. The house comes with a big garage where you can park your cars, and there's also a lot of room for storage. It's attached to the house through a door in the kitchen. Oh, that's perfect. It'll make it far easier to carry my food shopping into the house. Oh yes, absolutely. You actually don't even need to take your car to do the shopping, as the local supermarket is just down the street. You can walk the distance easily. Really? How convenient. Is there anywhere near to the house where I can take my children to play? Unfortunately, there aren't any playgrounds nearby, but there is a park near the supermarket that would be great for taking your children for a walk. It would also be a great place for you to meet your neighbours. Yes, that's true. I love taking long walks in the park. I'm sure there will be a playground at the local school anyway. Yes, absolutely. The community has its own primary school, and there is a secondary school in the neighbouring community, so there are plenty of resources nearby for your children's education. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10.
Okay, great. What are the rental costs for the property? The monthly rent is nine hundred and eighty dollars, which is very reasonable considering the size of the house and the amenities that it has to offer. Does that figure include maintenance fees and bills? The bills are not included in that figure, but it does include any maintenance fees for the garden. That sounds like a very reasonable price. We were hoping to move on the twentieth of April. Will the house be vacant for that date? The current tenants of the property are due to leave on the twentieth, but the cleaners will need a few days to make sure that the house is clean and tidy. This would make the house officially available on the twenty-third of April. Well, everything about the house sounds perfect. Exactly what I'm looking for. What date would it be possible to view the property? I have arranged for the tenant to leave the property on Friday, so I can show the house to prospective renters. Would you be able to make that day? Yes, I'm sure I could come on my lunch break. Would one o'clock be okay? I'm afraid that I have a meeting at twelve thirty, so I won't be able to make that time. I have available appointments at ten fifteen and three. Okay. In that case, can we schedule the appointment for ten fifteen? No problem. I'll book it into my schedule. If you wouldn't mind arriving five minutes early, that would be great. Just so we can get started on time. Sure. What is the address? The postcode is G A five eight E R, and the house is number eight on Spring Street. It's the second right off of Bath Street. Okay, that's great. Do you have any more questions? No,、nope. thank you for your help. No problem. See you on Friday. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a guide talking about a tourist program. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk, and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome to all of you. Can everyone see me and hear me? Good. My name's Kathy, and I'm here to tell you about the special program of events going on here at the Royal Observatory. Yes, it's Doors Open Day here in Edinburgh. And we're delighted that you have chosen to make this very special building part of your own Open Doors Day experience. Now, I'll make a start with giving you some background information about the Doors Open event. Doors Open takes place every year in September, and the observatory is one of the many buildings, a hundred and twelve of them in fact, that open their doors to visitors for one weekend. And yes, there's absolutely no charge. It's all completely free. The observatory has been involved in this event for more than twenty years, and every year we attract more and more visitors, like you, who want to find out more about great buildings in the city. And hopefully, you'll leave with a better understanding of the universe too. Okay, now let's run through today's program of events. There are many activities to choose from, 
so make sure you make the most of your visit. Now, there will be planetarium shows throughout the day. Now, these will run four times, both today and tomorrow, Sunday. These are popular, so please note that we're operating a booking system for these shows. Tickets for the two shows we're running this morning, the first showing at 10.30 and the second at 11.30, will be available on a first-come, first-served basis here at the information point. Tickets for the two afternoon shows at 2pm and then at 3pm will be released later on at midday. So booking is essential as spaces go very quickly. Now you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 15 to 20. We also have some special tours of the observatory available. These include a tour of the telescope dome and visitors will even have the opportunity to get onto the roof. I hope that those of you who are interested are wearing your most comfortable shoes and that you can keep up the pace. It will be worth the effort of climbing all these stairs. You'll have stunning views over the city when you reach the top. Now, for those of you who want to take things at a more leisurely pace, there will be an opportunity to visit the Crawford Collection and learn about the instruments that have been built here and there will also be some items from the collection on view. For those of you who don't already know, the Crawford Collection is an astronomical library. And not only that, it ranks as one of the most important astronomical libraries in the world. You are promised a real treat here. And it's great to have so many younger visitors here today. Now, we have a craft workshop for children here in the visitor centre where they can make their very own model of a telescope and colour their very own planet. Please note that all children must be accompanied by an adult. So. As you can see, it's a pretty full timetable and there's a lot going on. Now, any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a tutor giving advice to a student. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 28. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 28. Hi, Leo. What is it you wanted to ask me about? I'm worried about the exams. I don't mean if I pass them or not. I mean about revising. 
I don't think I know how to revise. I mean, every time I start looking back over my work, I just switch off. I can't concentrate. I don't think you're the first student that ever said that, Leo.、Mm. Are you revising at the right time? I mean, are you leaving it until too late at night when you've got no energy left? It's hard to achieve anything when you're exhausted. No, not really. It doesn't seem to make any difference what time it is.、Mm. Well, are you worrying too much about the subjects you feel you're not very good at? I mean, are you revising only what you find difficult? Hmm. I guess I am doing that. Isn't that the best approach to revision? Not necessarily. I'd say it's better to revise something you enjoy and something you feel confident about first.、Hmm. That'll get you into the swing of things, and then you can go on to more challenging things. Anyway. You have to think about the whole purpose of revision. Is the objective to do as well as you possibly can in your strong subjects, or to bring your weaker subjects up to an acceptable level? I'm not sure I see the point of revising what I think I'll pass anyway.、Uh, but revising a stronger subject might mean getting an A grade rather than a B.、Mm. That might be more rewarding and beneficial in the long run.、Mm. You might look back and feel a greater sense of pride in getting a couple of A grades than you would about scraping through three or four other subjects. Yes, I see what you're saying. I hadn't thought about it like that before. I'm not saying that that's what you should do. I'm trying to help you see the possibilities. Yes, I see that. Do you think I should accept that there are one or two subjects I'll fail and just forget about them? Oh, I wouldn't want to give you that advice.、Mm. I think you should go into each of the exams at least hoping for a pass grade.、Mm-hmm. My advice would be to set a time limit on how long you'll spend on each subject. You may want to spend a little longer on the subjects you find most difficult, but not an excessive amount of time. Yes, thanks. That's helpful advice. Do you have any more tips about how to go about the actual studying? I mean, how can I keep focused? Well, what sort of learner do you think you are? What do you mean? Well, if you're a visual learner, you like seeing things. From what I know of you, I think you probably are a very visual learner. Ah,、huh. so what does that mean in terms of revising? You probably learn best with images or diagrams. You could try organising information into tables or flowcharts. Hmm, I do sometimes make mind maps. Good idea. Ah,、huh. I think mind maps can really help you organise your thoughts. And another thing, have you thought about revising with other students? I didn't think that would be a good idea. I mean, if I can't concentrate by myself, <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be able to concentrate when there's another person there to distract me. Now you have some time to look at questions twenty-nine and thirty. Now listen to the rest of the conversation, and answer questions twenty-nine and thirty. Hmm, that probably isn't true. Another person might help you focus.、Mm. Lots of students get together with a friend, sometimes in groups, to revise. They usually work out some sort of structured procedure. Okay, I'll think about it. I guess with a friend you could test each other. I mean, revise for a while and then take it in turns to ask each other questions. Now you're thinking in the right direction. <laughs> you could also write short summaries or essay introductions, say, and then read and comment on each other's work.、Hmm. Both positive and critical comments coming from a peer can be very helpful. There are all sorts of collaborative strategies, and apart from anything else, having company is so much nicer than struggling through alone. <laughs> Okay, you've given me a lot to think about. Thanks for your time. I feel much more positive than I did. I'm really glad to hear that. Coming to see me in the first place was very sensible. <laughs> Do come back and tell me how things are going in a couple of weeks. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on the production and trade of rice. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning and welcome to our inaugural lecture on agricultural economics. Today's topic is the world's production and trade of rice. As you are all well aware, rice is the staple ingredient in the diet of much of the world's population. Its importance as a food cereal in the human diet cannot be underestimated. In fact. It's a close second to wheat. About 560 million metric tons of rice is grown each year, compared with about 600 million metric tons of wheat. Coarse grains such as corn, sorghum, barley, oats, rye, and millet mostly go into animal feed, which, by the way, is seen by many as a wasteful and inefficient use of fertile land. Because around four kilos of grain is needed to produce about half a kilo of beef, some nine hundred million metric tons of coarse grains are grown annually worldwide, and a further three hundred million metric tons of grain is produced for the oil in its seeds. Now I'll return to the subject of rice production. What do we know about rice production? Well, firstly. Rice produces more food energy per hectare than any other cereal grain, and almost as much protein per hectare as wheat. Secondly, the production of rice has more than doubled in the last forty years. How has this increase in production come about? Mainly as a result of improved field yields. The actual land area planted in rice has only risen by about thirty percent. As you know, rice is primarily grown in flooded fields, and therefore cultivation area is restricted by the sort of soil and the availability of water. Although rice can be grown on dry land, it is essentially, after all, a type of grass. The yields and quality in this case are much lower, and other grasses and weeds can easily overtake the rice. As yet, there are no herbicides that can selectively kill other grass types without killing the rice. Much of the world's rice is still grown and cultivated by hand, because for mechanized farming, the land must be able to be drained and hold heavy equipment. Of the total rice production, it's no surprise to learn that the greatest proportion, by far, is grown and consumed in Asia. You will see from the chart that the leading producers of rice are China at around 39 percent, followed by India with a quarter of the total. Indonesia produces almost one tenth, and other countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, Thailand, Japan, and Brazil grow another 25, almost 26 percent of the total. As I said before, most rice is consumed in the countries where it is grown. That means that very little rice is actually traded, and for this reason, the market price is very volatile. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Thank you for watching and stay tuned for more videos.